Good morning, hello. My name is Eugene Posniak, and I'm here to talk about independent medical education in Europe, who's calling the shots, and where it's going next. So, as a disclosure, I'm Managing Director of CME Learning, an independent education provider based in Manchester in the UK, and also Programme Director and Guarantor of the European CME Forum, a not-for-profit organisation that brings together people with an interest in CME in Europe. I have no relevant financial dis relationships to disclose according to CME principles, but both my organisations do receive grants from industry in order to develop independent medical education. So, on the agenda today, I'd first like to spend a little bit of time talking about medical education as a term, look at who the players are in this field, and how things are evolving. So, what is medical education? You, know, you speak to a number of people and they've got a different interpretation. We do need to remember in our professional environment that the people leaving school after their A-levels, high school, or whatever, the go to university to study medicine, are participating in medical education. Once they've received their medical degree as an undergraduate, they go into postgraduate training, the residency, the junior doctoring, the, the training to become a specialist. And this postgraduate training phase is also medical education. The part that's of most interest to us, from the viewers of this uh, video, our professional environment, whether it's in CME or in medcoms, when we refer to medical education, it's in that third stage, labelled here as CME. It's the stuff that doctors do from the time they've specialised in their early 30s until they the time they retire, which could be well into their 60s. This diagram, actually it's courtesy of European Society of Cardiology, I saw this in the early 2000s. They did a survey of their membership to try and quantify how much education doctors were doing at each stage of their careers. And they identified that most of the learning, most hours of having their noses in the books, in lectures, talking to mentors, tutors and lecturers, was in that undergraduate phase. Postgraduate training was still a significant amount, but what was really surprising was the small amount of education that specialists were actually undergoing in that time when they're facing patients and making uh, important clinical decisions. Which points nicely to why there is such a huge educational need for all of us to be involved in this. Okay, so who provides medical education for specialists in this third area, for specialists in Europe? Now clearly we have the medical societies and associations. In some countries there are universities and teaching hospitals that make this provision as well. The local employer, hospitals, and including here self-learning, so whether it's in small teams within the hospitals or individuals actually identifying what they do, that's also an important part of medical education. Then we have professional education, the CME providers, and I've called the last group industry and their agencies. And it's really these two last groups that I would like to go into greater depth. The first three are actually quite self-explanatory. You'll see there's an asterisk under the medical societies and CME providers. That's just to highlight that European medical societies, and certainly in the States, are actually becoming CME providers. They're becoming education providers. In the States, they're even accredited as ACCME accredited providers. In Europe, they're not just doing education in their annual conferences, but they're actually spreading their wings a bit and doing far more education for their specialists. Some time ago, in very much inspired by Mendeleev, uh, my sons were doing a project on him at the time while he was designing his um, uh, periodic table. I wrote down all the kind of educational activities that I'd been involved in and seen throughout my career. So a lot of this is a traditional medcoms um, 
ad agency kind of, kind of work, and also uh, during my experience as a CME provider. And I took a spectrum where at one end we have pure promotion, and at the other end we call it pure education. So taking that list that you just saw, the one activity that could be termed as pure promotion is so promotional that it is actually governed by the commercial promotional standards uh, nationally and across Europe is the press ad. What doctors read in a journal or a uh, trade magazine of some kind, you've got the press advertisement as pure promotion and at the other end the pure education would be the completely arm's length independently designed and delivered CME program. So going back to all these activities, just seeing where would they actually appear on this spectrum. So what comes with the press advertisements is usually some kind of detail aiding. There'll be a mailing campaign where there's some kind of interaction with the doctors. Um, going all the way down to the standalone symposia, satellite symposia. And there should be much more online activity in there as well, but that's quite difficult to define because, it, of course, it could appear anywhere on, on this spectrum. But when it comes to learning, actual formal education, I've called it there e-learning 1, e-learning 2. But the important thing with this spectrum is to then think what kind of organisation works with these kind of activities. And, and a nice picture emerges where... At the top end of the scale, these are the kind of traditional things that advertising agencies do. When it comes to public relations and running certain kinds of advisory boards, kind of things that ad agencies wouldn't normally do, that would sit in the PR agency remit. A lot of the scientific communications, whether it's with journals or in meetings, are looked after by the Medcoms agency. And the bubble at the bottom where we've got professional CME provider, the pure CME side of things is done by that group. And it's quite deliberate. There is an overlap here. And if you're working for one of these agency types to the next, maybe you'll see the kind of activities that you're trying to diversify as a group to, to move into. But of course, you wouldn't leapfrog from one to the other because it just wouldn't be a natural progression to make. And where does industry fit in with all of this? And this also comes a, 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 highlights an interesting point. The ad agency, PR agency, and Medcom's agency, they're all agencies. They are agents of their client. They are agents of their industry payers. And industry controls all the activities of these three groups. However, when it comes to the CME provider, because it's arm's length outside of the control of industry, Industry can only be, there's a dotted line there that can help fund that activity, but it can't control it. The actions of the CME provider are not governed by industry regulations standards. This slide really just summarizes what I've, I've just said. So when it comes to CME, industry must be at arm's length when providing grant funding to education providers. And this is true of whether they're professional providers or the medical societies. So, who's involved in medical education in Europe? We've talked about the medical societies and associations. We've talked about the industry as a group the Medcoms, PR, advertising agency sector, the professional education, CME providers, and there is another important group that's helping to form the medical education environment in Europe, and those are the CME accreditation bodies. And I'd like to propose a, a graphic here where we have these four groups, or at least these groups are put in, and look a bit deeper into how each of these groups are interacting with medical education in Europe. So first off, all industry. Now looking how industry is approaching medical education, there has been, through external factors, such as the Bribery Act, 
Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the States, European laws on bribery and corruption rules, and accountancy practice where there needs to be much more accountability for how money is spent, industry are now looking at how they're funding medical education and starting to say, well, hang on, are we controlling this education or are we just handing over money for someone to do something? Are we putting on education or promotion of our products to educate doctors on our agenda? Or are we handing over money like sponsorship of a local brass band, rugby team, whatever it may be, where they've got no influence over what happens? And these are the decisions that are being made by compliance departments in the drug companies as the accountants are signing off and lawyers how the company is spending the money. So this has had a knock-on effect into medical education. So they're now saying, well, is this company initiated and controlled or is it an arm's length educational grant? If it's an arm's length educational grant and they don't have that control, how can they be reassured that the money that they're actually handing over is, is a worthwhile activity to do? So there are questions about making that financial support more relevant. So industry is asking more questions as to how their money is spent and they're becoming more discerning of how much they spend for what kind of results and for what kind of effect. So the two different types of medical education that we're seeing, we see the company initiated and controlled education, the kind of stuff that medcoms agencies do, a lot of the digital campaigns, the way they're interacting with patient groups, hospitals, medical societies. So that could be, yeah, that's company initiated and controlled. And the arm's length medical education, we see here as well, the medical societies. So when I was mentioning earlier about medical societies getting involved in medical education for their specialists, this is where the funding would come from. And we're seeing a rise in the professional education uh, providers, the CME providers, which only operate by arm's length grants from industry. That bottom bubble on that spectrum that we saw a few slides ago. So coming back to our uh, diagram here, really industry has a relationship with providers because they fund them. They still have a relationship with medical societies and now they have a relationship with CME accreditors as well because they're handing over arm's length grants so they need to be mindful of the requirements of the CME accreditors in how they fund medical education. And what I'd like to do is, is also push up these two lozenges. So instead of all industry and, and all the kind of agencies and providers, we'll have a separate section called company controlled for company controlled medical education. We have departments within, the, the, within industry controlling, commissioning medical education for their target audience as part of their marketing activities. And the agencies, the medcoms agencies, ad agencies, who are there serving their industry client to do company controlled education. So medical societies, as the next group, what have they seen in recent years? They've seen a reduction in income from industry. And this is across the board. Gone is the time when a drug company would hand over a large check and just say, we trust you, spend it how you want, we look forward to seeing you at your next annual congress, where we will turn up and put up a huge exhibition stand, we will take two or three satellite symposium slots, and it did go into seven figures. There was a huge investment of industry in medical society activities, but they've seen that this has dropped off. There's a reduction in exhibition space, fewer satellite symposia, they're having to lower their fees, and the sponsorship levels are going down. And why is that? Well, for the same reason that we had when we're looking at the industry side of things. It's because when industry hands over money, they need to account for how it's being spent, what are the objectives, how much money is going to be spent for each activity. They're now looking at a return on investment on exhibition space, the amount of traffic. So as we know, if we go to these annual conferences, the exhibition areas now are slightly separated from the educational parts of the meeting. So the traffic is going down. They're, the industry rules for promotion 
also means that they can say fewer things at the stand, give away less enticing, exciting gifts. So gone are those laser pointers and cuddly toys and, and all those uh, conference bag stuffers that, that we used to see 10, 15 years ago. And because of this, they're lowering their investment in the annual conferences and the overall sponsorship levels are going down. And of course, medical societies are hugely supported by industry funding. So as a result of this, medical societies are changing the way that they interact with their specialist audience. Actually, some of them are doing very well with their specialists in training, with the diplomas, the examinations that they run, which is also a huge activity, very worthwhile and also lucrative. But in order to satisfy their educational needs, they need to attract grants, these independent grants from industry. So we see many of these medical societies may be running extra subspecialty meetings that are CME accredited to attract those specialists that wouldn't necessarily come to their larger conferences, but they would come to that subspecialty meeting because it's really targeted at their needs. The e-learning, and I mean e-learning very generally, anything that's available from a screen, whether it's some kind of periscope method from, for broadcasting the live, sim, uh, the live congresses, the live meetings, or something that's archived, where they've taken education and put online within a CME accredited, or not necessarily CME accredited way, but it also raises an income from their membership. And also they're more careful to ha on how guidelines are being developed especially the societies that are influenced by the US counterparts, it's very tricky to actually develop guidelines that are supposedly independent and at arm's length from industry when you're using directly controlled spend from industry marketing budgets. So there is an awareness to actually say, well, hang on, if we're going to develop guidelines, of course it needs to be funded in some way. Let's look at the funding. Perhaps we can get arm's length grants from industries, but this is all being looked at. So the total pot available to medical societies is still probably the same. However, in the past few years, we're seeing this trend towards more accountability and breakdown of activities and more soul searching by medical societies and more innovative educational programming for their specialists. So looking at the medical society side of things, they can act as a provider, or sometimes they work in collaboration with providers to develop these new independent educational activities. Of course, they still have a relationship with industry. And I've put in a dotted line here for company controlled because that route is still there. Marketing spend from industry is still going to medical societies. And as medical societies attract independent grant funding and put on independent education that's accredited, of course, they have a strong relationship with the CME accreditors. Now the professional, uh, excuse me, the professional education providers themselves, these CME providers. So, so these guys didn't really exist for a long time. It's only a relatively recent development and it's evolving into a dedicated sector. It's clear that these organizations do not do any product promotion and nothing they do is allowed to be company controlled. They don't see the industry funder as being a client. Yeah, it's, yes, they will be accountable to them to say, this is how we've spent the money. After all, we know that industry now, when they hand over money, need to know what the purpose is for, how much, how much is being spent, and in what way is it compliant under, under national laws. So, of course, the provider has to remember to, sorry, the provider is, is uh, uh, has commitments in, in that respect. These providers do seek independent grants from industry and look to develop partnerships with the profession. So whether it's a chair of a, an educational activity or on a larger level with a local hospital, national hospital, medical society, or groups of physicians, this is the, these are the, sort of the clients now that the CME providers are looking at. And they need, to be in, they need to ensure that whatever they do is independent and CME compliant. And this, of course, means that they're developing education that addresses an identified practice gap and not the marketing objectives of a drug company and not 
the whim of a professional group because they'd like to go to a nice island somewhere to discuss very important medical things. The prof professional providers actually approach education in a very systematic way. So the provider is reliant on industry funding. Of course, it won't touch anything that's company controlled. And they do separate themselves from the agency sector. I hope I've managed to explain how these differences show that there is, there is a big difference between these two groups. And it also explain why some medcoms agencies are, while they're talking to their industry clients, are finding, oh, actually, there may be some kind of grant funding available from a colleague down the corridor, but they're not allowed to talk to them, but they may actually ask their holding organisation or set up a complementary CME provider that works completely independently from them to address the educational grant side of things. Of course, the provider, as I mentioned, would uh, have, have strong relations with the medical societies and, of course, they have to work according to the CME rules of the accreditors. So, fine, our final group, the CME accreditation bodies. So, in recent years, actually, they, they, they were set up around that sort of 2000 uh, time, and, and it was really just a self-serving kind of activity that they would just give a, a stamp of accreditation for education that was being put together. And it was, looking back now, it seems that it's, it was quite a rubber stamping uh, activity. And through these external factors, they are needing really to look much more carefully at what they're doing for their own clients, ultimately the, the medical profession. Because the certificates they give out, or that they accredit, the accreditation they, they give to activities, these are now used for relicensing, recertification. They're used for real activities by individual doctors. It's no longer just evidence that they're sort of keeping up to date. Now, if you add up, they have to add up, in certain countries, they have to add up the points, show the evidence to their authority in order to maintain their license to practice medicine. It's much more important now as a demonstration that there's no bias. This industry non-bias is a very important question because now if we think of industry, when they're handing over money as an edu educational grant, they have to sign off that they have not been involved in the education. So this evidence really comes from the CME certificate. And the accreditation body really needs to ensure that whatever they accredit is actually unbiased, that the drug company has not been involved in any way, that product messages aren't slipping through, that the faculty is delivering high quality education that, it's, that is non-biased. So the accreditation standards need to improve. Their activities thus supports regulators. They're driving standards. They have these multiple clients because there are a whole host of organizations now that are applying to them for accreditation, medical societies, hospitals, professional providers. So, and each can have a different need. A small medical society may be wanting to have a workshop accredited for 10 people, or it could be a huge European society meeting with 30,000 delegates. How do you balance the accreditation standards so that they are consistent across everything but are relevant to both types of, or both extremes of, of education. And ultimately, really, the accreditation should demonstrate that the education addresses educational needs. So looking at our graphic here, the CME accreditors, of course, have strong relations with medical societies and providers, but I've got a dotted line really looking at industry because while they don't have a direct relationship, whatever the accreditation body does has to satisfy industry requirements, that the, the pressures that they're under. So we're just coming up to my last couple of slides as, as a summary. Just pulling everything together, really we see that these different groups cannot work in silos. They can't go off on their own and say, oh, we will come up with our own standards or our own ways of behaviour. Everyone is interlinked with every other part, however much they like it or not. But, but each sector has to be mindful of, of every other partner in this, in this uh, medical education picture. And 
even though it looks like a lot of things have changed, actually, uh, from a personal perspective, I think the past 10 years has been quite messy, but it's crystallizing into nice shapes like this. And ultimately, if you look at all the groups here, all parties are looking more towards the common goal of developing education that's designed to improve competence and performance of healthcare professionals and ideally to improve patient outcomes. I've just read that straight off the slide. Really, we've just got the patient at heart and everyone together is looking to help the system, the healthcare professionals, to deliver better healthcare at the end of the day. Great, thank you for your time.